So some of you will know I'm Brinsley Dresden. I'm the head of advertising law at Lewis Silkin. Uh, we are the UK's leading advertising and marketing law firm. Uh, and I have a massive team of extremely able colleagues uh, who support me uh, in the team. But today I'm afraid it's just me. And these are the topics um, which hopefully are as promised. This is what we put up on the website. So this is what you should be expecting to see. Um, it's always difficult when I set the topics to know how much content there's going to be. Um, so, the, sorry, the first one I should say, the first topic is the, the new gender stereotyping rule and the, the first ASA decision. So, just a quick reminder about the rule. Advertisements must not include gender stereotypes that are likely to cause um, serious harm, uh, sorry, cause harm or serious or widespread offence. And just a word about that, that form of words is that serious or widespread offence, but not necessarily serious harm. And this actually has made us sort of given us some pause for thought as we look at these first adjudications where we can see that there is potential for some harm, but it's quite difficult to say whether it's necessarily serious harm. Um, and then the rule itself is very short and actually doesn't take the old rule all that much further. But what the ASA did also produce was some much more comprehensive guidance about how they would interpret the rule. And you can see there that they allow um, glamorous, attractive and successful people. So you can have good looking models in ads without it breaking the rule. You can have ads uh, with one gender only or targeting one gender only, obviously. Um, and you can have gender stereotypes as a means to challenge them in negative effects. So it's not like a blanket prohibition. Um, and we got some guidance for the first time this year. So um, fortunately, the lady from Mondelez is late, which is kind of good news for me, because it's always a bit embarrassing when you, uh, you play an ad and there's somebody from that company in the audience. So before she gets here, I shall quickly play the ad. So this is for Philadelphia. So you may have seen this. New dad too. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at this lunch. Yeah, hard to choose. Oh, this looks good. Mm, that's really good. Well, that's the Philadelphia. Mm. Yeah. Let's not tell mom. They grabbed the complaints immediately. They had trailed that the new rule was coming in six months before. Um, so what the ASA's position was, you should have been thinking about this when you uh, were creating your ads to go on air in June. These were on air in June, and we'll see. We'll look at these three, um, and we'll see what view they took. This attracted 128 complaints, um, including, I think, basically stay-at-home dads saying this is unfair and it's a gender stereotype. Uh, Mondelez tried to say, well, it's just, it's just a joke. It's just funny. Um, and we make clear that the children came to no harm. Um, Clearcast had pointed to the the guidance and said that um, it was okay to show a momentary lapse in concentration by somewhat overwhelmed and tired new parents that was quickly realized and rectified. But of course, they are only dads. Um, and one of the killer points actually was that at the end, um, well, at the beginning, you see the, you know, the mum handing over the baby to the dad and looking a little bit concerned and doubtful. Um, and then let's not tell mum at the end uh, not clear whether he's saying that to the baby. Well, obviously, the baby's not going to tell mum. I say that to my children all the time. When things go wrong at home and my wife's away, we all agree we have a pact that no one's going to tell mum about whatever disaster has unfolded. Apparently, I'm not allowed to do that anymore. So that was uh, upheld. Now, this one, I think the, the case against this one is a bit more marginal. There were only three complaints about this compared with 128 for the first one. Um, and again, the, the, the charge is that they were perpetuating harmful gender stereotypes uh, by showing the men in contrast 
uh, to the women, the men doing the, the adventurous activities and the woman in a caregiving role. Um, as I say, the, the, there was a woman at the beginning, you can't really see, but there is a woman in the tent at the beginning as well. Um, there seems to be some suggestion that one of the astronauts, the one at the back, was a woman. I've watched it several times. It's pretty hard to tell. And the person in the foreground is clearly a man, so I'm not sure about that. Um, and VW sort of said, well, you know, the shot at the end is just about becoming a new parent. It could have been a man, it could have been a woman, it happened to be a woman, doesn't mean it's gender stereotyping. Um, and the ASA didn't, didn't accept that. Um, and said that it was, it was juxtaposing the men in the adventurous role with the woman in, in the caregiving role. Um, so given that contrast between those two roles, they upheld the complaints. And I know that VW and their agency were, were very aggrieved about that and thought that that was a very harsh decision. But it's, it's so subjective, and this is one of our, our concerns about the lack of the word serious in relation to harm, um, one does question you know, quite how harmful that really is. Um, I think, to be honest, it probably depends a little bit whether you're a man or a woman, if I'm honest. I think men probably shrug their shoulders and think, oh, it's not that bad, and women probably who've experienced more gender discrimination are more likely to uh, think it shouldn't be, it, it breaks the rule. But even then, that's probably a gender stereotype right there, me saying that. So. Rock bottom, the start of the journey. There will be obstacles, but it's all about finding a way through, pushing on, upwards, until finally reaching the top. Buxton, here's to the up and coming. So this was the third of, the th of these three ads, all published on the same day. And this one was not upheld. Again, only five complaints, so far fewer than there were for the, for the Mondelez Philadelphia but a couple more than there had been for VW. Um, and again, people were concerned that um, you've got the ballerina, kind of archetypal gender stereotype female role in contrast with the drummer and the um, rower, and who's also, I think, the same person who's exercising on the, on the, on the bike. Um, and, but, but, but the advertiser and Clearcast were successful in saying, look, this is about high achieving people in their field overcoming obstacles and you know being the best they can be and reaching the top of their of their respective fields and there's nothing particularly um gender stereotypical about it um i you know when we're advising now we tend to say to clients you know you really have to have a ballerina how about a male ballet dancer or um, I've been advising a client recently who's also got a drummer, but the drummer in the ad that's not yet on air is a female drummer, for example. I mean, God knows, I think the um, British rowing team, there's many of the medals we've won in recent Olympics have been women, so they could have had a female rower. So I think that one was okay in the end. That was on the right side of the line, um, partly because I think the, athlete, the woman we see is... is is really exerting herself physically. She's not like a dainty little sugar plum fairy, but um, it's close to the margin. And I think certainly we're advising clients increasingly to, to think very carefully about how you, know, how you make these portrayals. Um, so that was the, that's where we are so far on gender stereotyping. Um, there's been a lot on influencer marketing this year. Uh, the year started with the Competition and Markets Authority uh, investigation into, I think it's 16 influencers whose names are here. Um, it was only directed against the influencers. None of the brands were investigated, uh, none of the platforms. And um, however, it is notable that the, all the context was all, all on Instagram. So nobody on Facebook, nobody on YouTube. These were just people on Instagram. And I think that's because if you, if you go back a year or two, I think the ASA were quite frustrated that um, Instagram hadn't engaged with them as much as the other platforms had on trying to be compliant and trying to develop uh, platform tools and that kind of thing. So I don't think it is an accident that they were 
only talking to these people about what they were doing on Instagram. And also Instagram, of course, I think seems to be the one where the, this type of marketing is its most pervasive. Um, they settled in January, they finally um, published the outcome. They, they settled all of the prosecutable investigations, but they did get formal undertakings from everybody um, and they uh, obtained these people's agreement to change their practices in return for not prosecuting them. Um, the ASA then said, oh, sorry, the CMA concluded that there's no set ways of labeling endorsements. Each social media platform is different and constantly changing and individual influencers have diverse creative styles. So what they're saying is, we're not having just one rule, um, but you've got to find a way of doing it. The truth is, the, I mean, the ASA always say the same thing. Oh no, there's no, we're not prohibitive, we're not prescriptive. You can say whatever you want. So like, okay, can I say something other than hashtag ad then? No. <laughs> I mean, you can in theory, and they're always at pains to say it's not prescriptive. But whenever anybody tries anything other than hashtag ad, they seem to end up with an uphill complaint. So it's difficult. Um, and our commentary on this is that the relevant disclosures have got to be clear, prominent, and upfront. And that comes across time and time again. Clear, prominent, and upfront are the, are the main things to bear in mind. Um, so, yeah, from the, for the influencers, they've got to say, as well as saying when they've been given things, they do also need to be say, well, when they've been paid to do something, they, from the CMA's point of view, the CMA are also concerned about just when they've um, received free gifts because the CMA is applying the, uh, the consumer protection regulations, which are more broadly applied than the ASA's cap code. So the ASA want to know whether there's been both payment um, and control. So we've had situations where clients have come to us and said, we gave this person a free gift, we gave them some of our products, they then, but we didn't tell them what to say, or when to say it, or anything at all. Um, they just magically, of their own volition, said some really nice things about our products. So we go, okay, well, if you didn't exercise any editorial control at all, then it's outside ASA remit, and the ASA will accept that. But the, the CMA is applying the test under the, the CPRs, which is a slightly different one, which is about whether you're falsely posing as a consumer. And when you think about it, if you're a consumer, you have bought something and paid for it. And when you say something good about it, it's on the context of, you know, I've, I've parted with my hard-earned cash for this product, so when I tell you, oh, I really like this jacket, it's because you're happy with it and you like the style and the cut and the blah, blah, blah. Whereas if you've just been given it as a freebie, you might be more inclined to say something nice. You might be inclined to say something nice in the hope that you'll get more freebies in the future. Um, so one of the key things that came out of all of this was that you'll, you may now, if you go onto Instagram, you'll see influencers using hashtag gifted, which has caused some difficulty because apparently some people think that means, oh, I'm just so talented and I'm, this is hashtag aren't I brilliant, which was not the intention. Um, hashtag freebie also, which I, we, ha we were suggesting that to some clients and they were going, oh, no, we don't like that. But I think from a regulatory point of view, it works very well. Um, and, in, and in the context of Instagram and the typical people using Instagram, if they see a fashion blogger saying hashtag freebie, then they understand what that means. Um, but the CMA is saying as well that the the influencers have got to kind of indicate if they've had a free gift for 12 months after they've received the gift. And that's creating, that's created a new challenge for them. Thus far, I have no reason to believe it's not working, but I think a lot of them, they get unbelievable amounts of gear sent to them on an unsolicited basis all of the time. And they previously were not keeping any kind of record about when they got stuff, where it came from, now we're sort of saying you, you have to have an inventory um, and you have to know, yeah, okay, I got that jacket on that date. So if I, if I now even just tag it in a picture for the next 12 months, I've got to somehow indicate that it was a free gift. So these are the ones which uh, we think are more likely to comply. Um, plus in, there are emerging these platform tools like um, paid partnership on Instagram 
um, which the ASA hasn't endorsed, but equally they've had ample time now to investigate if they wanted to and they haven't, so we're kind of taking silence to mean consent. Um, and then these ones which seem to be less likely to comply. And there's a slight problem as well. I've had long conversations with US clients because the FTC have indicated that if you put in, um, it's on this slide or the next one, you know, uh, brand ambassadors always a difficult one, but I think the FTC guidance suggests that if, say it was a, um, think of a good example, L'Oreal. If you had L'Oreal underscore brand ambassador, particularly if you had L'Oreal in block capitals, the FTC seemed to think that as a whole, that is an adequate disclosure. Whereas the ASA will just say nobody, nobody really knows what a brand ambassador is. And in particular, they might realize that you're being paid, but they won't realize that L'Oreal are uh, controlling the content. Which seems, I think, is not a particularly persuasive argument because you know, if, if I'm the British ambassador, then you expect me to spout the line that's been fed to me by the British government, not my own private opinion on something. Um, and the same is true, I would have said, of a brand ambassador. But all of these ones at various points have been, you know, challenged. Um, so, yeah, tagging, you need to be careful about. Uh, both, I mean, there's been, the FTC as well don't like uh, tagging um, or think that if you do tag, you need to give disclosure. Um, yeah, so all of these are other examples of things that have been uh, problematic. My wife and I, I showed my wife the slides last night and she said, who is that? <laughs> um, and then we, we kind of felt very tearful when we realized that our daughter probably knows and is probably influenced by this woman. Um, you can see she's got hashtag ad now, but she didn't when this was originally investigated. And she's another one of these, um, I think she's a uh, Love Island type person. Um, so, and she was paid to do this by Coco Brown. Um, now, interestingly, of course, it's not at the beginning of her post. So, well, it is, she's got, now got it here and here. Um, it would be better if it said paid partnership up there. That's what it really should do, uh, immediately below her name. Um, I think the ASA can live with this as amended. Um, but it was, it was just the typical kind of thing. Um, and she did try to argue that, the, that it was in her, in her um, bio. And she did say that she's got brand ambassador there. I actually think that even the FTC, who are a little bit more tolerant on this, wouldn't have allowed that and would have said, uh, it should have said, hashtag, Coco Brown in block caps underscore brand ambassador. Um, and then they, they might have accepted that. But this is just, you know, the latest in a long line. Um, now, these ones were a bit more interesting. So this is a, a woman who blogs about um, sort of motherhood and parenthood and that kind of thing. And um, this was something she was paid to do on the, on the bedside table there there's a packet of a, of a product by, from Sanofi, Sanofi, the big pharma company. Um, and then the text, which you can't read, is there. And basically, she's talking about the wonders of this product um, if you suffer from insomnia. And it's, a, it's an over-the-counter product that will help you sleep. Um, so the question was whether they'd used a celebrity um, to Sanofi had used a celebrity to endorse uh, an over-the-counter medicine, which is, would be a breach of Rule 12.1. Uh, Sanofi said, well, this Mama Life only has 32,000 followers. Um, I think I've got about 195. So if you're from a pharma brand and you're looking for somebody to uh, endorse your products, I'm available. Um, and they said, look, compare that with Stephen Fry, who's got three, 359,000. David Beckham, 55 million. Um, 
And they also said that they'd run it past the Proprietary Association of Great Britain, which is the trade association for, for pharma, pharma companies. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, I do stand here criticising the ASA, but I think, I think this is right. It clearly is a medicine. It's an over-the-counter medicine. Um, I mean, if you're, why would you follow that woman unless you're her friend? Right? Why would anybody follow anybody else unless you know, there's something about them that, that, that you're interested in? So to that sense, she's got well over 1,000 followers. It must, she does have, in this context, some kind of celebrity status, which is why 32,000 people follow her. Um, and she has positively endorsed the product, so it clearly is an ad. And also, she's clearly said what they've asked her to say. So I think that one was, was correct. Um, and then, similarly, um, this was a partnership. Uh, this was a, by, by um, Katie Price. There's a couple of examples. Just pausing for a moment, just to point out, can you see uh, uh, on the top right, um, below her, her, um, her name, it says, official Katie Price paid partnership with BoomBod. So we do have, so the issue here is not about failure to disclose an ad. She's done that. She's used the platform tool successfully. Um, but we've got these before and after pictures of Katie. Um, and then, as part of the same complaint, this lady, Lauren Goodger. Now, I have to admit, I, did, I do know who Katie Price is, and I did know before this. This woman, I have to admit, I had no knowledge of. Um, but this is part of the same process. This one, she's actually not used the, um, the Instagram platform disclosure. Um, but she has, and, but, and interestingly, she's kind of done this right in as much as she's got hashtag ad here. So it is up front. So as soon as you see it, even on your phone, you ought to see that disclosure before you engage. I actually think it's less obvious than when it comes at the end of the post and is in a different color. But it's that's not what they were done for. Um, so what they were done for were these, these things. Um, and Katie talks about these wonderful products that help her lose weight. Um, and Laura talks about the seven-day achiever. Um, and so there were five complaints. First of all, that they were making health claims which were not authorised on the EU register for health claims for foods. Um, second issue was that they were making references about the a rate of weight loss or the amount of weight loss that you could achieve. Um, and the third, that they were pr pr promoting di a dieting project in an irresponsible manner. Um, so the company said, well, we'll take the ads down. Well, fine. That's good from a PR purpose, but it doesn't actually change the fact there's been a breach. Um, and Laura said, oh, I only claimed it helped me with my bloating and my hunger. Well, it is a product called Seven Day Weight Loss Plan, so that wasn't terribly convincing. Um, and Katie said that it only communicated her thoughts on the product. Uh, surprise, surprise, uh, these were all upheld. Um, that is the authorised claim that you're allowed to make for glucomannan, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, but there is more detail you're supposed to give. There is some latitude when you're making these sorts of products, uh, these sorts of claims. You are allowed to adapt them a little bit, but you're not allowed to edit out really significant information um, or to exaggerate their meaning. And... Um, so they failed to do that successfully. The, all the references to seven-day claims were effectively references to the weight of weight loss. Um, and they also said that they were using influencers to promote the product. The, the ASA were concerned that, um, in, that even with the before and after here, they don't like before and after. And they would say, if you look at the before photo, she looks fine. She doesn't need to lose weight. So they were unhappy about that. Rather, um, I thought, embarrassingly for Laura, they said the picture of Laura had been photoshopped to make her look thinner, which seemed a bit harsh. Um, 
And also, I don't think it has been. I think I can see what they, they're worried, I think, about this bit of black here, but I think that's from her, her sweatpants. Um, so I'm not sure it has been photoshopped, so I think they were slightly harsh on Laura, but uh, right results. But really, the interesting thing about this is we've seen, you know, loads and loads of ASA investigations dealing with issues about disclosure as ads. We're now getting into some other issues around uh, things like health claims and weight loss claims. Then, uh, then the ASA published th their own report about the labelling of influencer advertising on the back of this research that they'd commissioned from Ipsos Mori, uh, um, where they'd, they'd spoken to consumers. Um, and they came to a number of conclusions. You've got to make sure that the label's sufficiently obvious to be noticed, so that's about how it's placed, and that it can be understood, so that's about the language used. And the recommendations then, it's got to be visually prominent, it's got to be positioned uh, in such a way that it will be seen, the language has got to be clear and explicit. If you use a logo, that will help to identify it as an ad. Um, and it would help for, for people to be consistent using the same labels. The, um, what I think came as a bit of a sort of surprise to the ASA was, was how often ads which were clearly labelled in accordance with their recommendations were still not recognised as ads by consumers, which is slightly worrying. Um, so I think the ASA were sort of a little, you know, it was a little bit of a mixed bag of results for them. Um, there was also some suggestion that labels which the ASA have previously you know, frowned on, like hashtag sponsorship, that perhaps um, advertisers, uh, consumers do understand that that means it's, it's effectively an advert. Um, and I, mean, I know from Facebook, you often see posts which are labelled as sponsored posts, which is a, a way of saying it's an ad. So maybe a few years ago, people didn't understand or there was a risk that people wouldn't understand that sponsored meant an ad. But now, everybody's used to seeing sponsored posts on Facebook. Perhaps it's become more, more obvious to people. 